Hello, good evening, and welcome to Iron Port here on Metropolitan Television. Iron Port is proudly brought to you by the Ghana Revenue Authority, Goyle Company Limited, Serene Insurance, Ghana Link Network Services, and Meridian Port Services, MPS. The show is proudly powered by the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, GPHA. Uh, this show tonight is streaming live on our social media pages on Facebook. We are streaming live at Ghana Port and Harbors Authority, Ghana Port and Harbors Authority. And then still on Facebook, we are streaming live at Port of Tema. And on YouTube, we are streaming live at Iron Port, Ghana. Indeed, we shall be getting interactive with you uh, in the course of the program, and all you have to do is send us your messages and comments via our dedicated WhatsApp line, which is 0559-019-177, 0559-019-177, and at the appropriate time, we shall share it with the rest of the world. Indeed, when the time is ripe, I shall be activating the phone lines for you to call in and contribute to the discussion. Our media partner on this journey of a lifetime is the Business and Financial Times, the BNFT. And so if you want to have a grasp of all that transpired on the show tonight, make a date and grab the Thursday edition of the BNFT and you'll be able to see all that happened here on the show tonight. My name is Kennedy Mona. We are going for a quick break. When we bounce back, we'll continue with the discussion. Please do stay with us. Every now and again, Goyle makes good things happen. This time, Goyle has introduced Super XP Run 95, a higher grade fuel loaded with additives and yet sold at the same price as normal fuel. Goal Super XP Run 95 enhances engine performance like never before. It maintains the engine by keeping it clean from carbon deposits. Goal Super XP Run 95 is designed to burn slowly and thus improves fuel economy, making you save money after several kilometers. Goal Super XP Run 95 gives you a smooth driving experience that is less vibrations. Fill up with Goal Super XP Run 95. Now there's no need to pay more for any higher grade fuel. Goyle has that sorted. Goyle, good energy. Because you see, without our taxes, we wouldn't have good roads, good schools, better hospitals, street lights, and other very important social amenities. When we pay our taxes, we give our children free and quality education. Tell that my money too small. Why should I pay my tax? Look, small. Selfo, it doesn't matter how small or big your business or income is. You still have to pay your taxes. The little taxes from each and every one of us, when put together, could give your community clean water. Or that deprived school with tables and chairs. Please pay your taxes. It is your responsibility. It is your civic duty. It is the law. Impressive factory. If only I had listened to you, I wouldn't have been in this mess. That devastating fire virtually wiped out the whole factory and my warehouse. Remember my misfortunes last year? Serene insurance assets all risk fire policies that I took were there to pay for my damaged stocks in the warehouse. And my machines that were affected by the floods have been replaced. My accident vehicle is back on the road. Thanks to Serene Insurance Motor Policy. Suddenly my goods are on the IC covered with the American cargo insurance policy. I was just telling Ajima about Serene Insurance. Oh, Ajima. Tell him more. As a road contractor, I make sure I do my contractors all risk insurance for the projects and then workers compensation for all the workers on site with serene insurance they will make sure they will cover your unknown tomorrow today serene insurance a new face of insurance call us now MPS Terminal 3 is Africa's new state-of-the-art container terminal at Tema Port. For manufacturers, agro-processors and traders, the new port means business can be done faster. This infrastructure boost will improve Ghana's port handling capacity, connect more trading routes and oil the engine of growth for the economy, creating greater opportunities across all sectors as Africa's markets merge and become the largest trading block globally. MPS, we connect, you thrive.
You're welcome back. It's now time for us to take a look at happenings in the port and shipping industry in the course of the week. And uh, during the week, the president had been busy, he has been busy. Indeed, he was in the port of Takrade to commission two mega projects and also cut out for two mega projects as well. Uh, plus, the fact that Ghana Link Network Services in the course of the week also signed a memorandum of understanding with his Korean counterparts. Let's take a look at these stories and more. President Nanado Dankwa Ekufuado has commissioned a modern dry bulk terminal in the Atlantic Container Terminal at the port of Takrade. According to the president, the two projects are indications that the government is determined to improve maritime trade and position it as a major engine of economic growth. The dry bulk terminal was developed at a cost of $86 million by the Ghana Port and Harbors Authority for the handling of manganese, clinker, bauxite, and iron ore. The phase one of the container the terminal was developed by an indigenous engineering firm, Ibistec Ghana Limited, at a cost of $250 million. The president also cut sword for the development of a floating dry dock facility for ship and rig repairs to be developed by a private entity, Prime Meridian Docks Limited, as well as the development of an oil and gas services terminal being constructed at a cost of $98 million. The dry bulk terminal has been equipped with an efficient cargo handling system to facilitate the accurate measurement of various export volumes for manganese and bauxite to check compliance. With a design capacity of 2,500 tons per hour, the new bulk terminal is also expected to improve productivity, shorten the turnaround time of vessels, and bring big savings to shippers of manganese and bauxite. The chairman of Ibistec, Kwame Jan, said the company and its partners had since 2017 invested an amount of $332.7 million in various projects at the Takrade port, a feat he said was made possible with unwavering support from the president. Your Excellency, the president, you stood by us in this period of adversity. You were with us, your counsel, your encouragement has brought us this far. And to the Minister of Transport, I think you deserve a gold star for your role in getting this thing to happen. The Director General of the Ghana Ports and Abbas Authority, Michael Luguji, said the ultra-modern dry bulk terminal would be operated by GPH staff who have been competently trained for that purpose. This modern facility that was being built, a lot of questions were being asked whether we are going to engage some expatriates to come and run it or we can do it ourselves. Your Excellency, I'm very proud to inform you that this entire facility will be run by GPH staff. And they have been competently trained, and they are highly motivated to ensure that it works. And indeed, our expectation is also that when the oil and gas services terminal is completed, GPHA will 100% run that facility as well. So we are really grateful for the encouragement we've received and the support in terms of finances for us to develop these facilities. The Western Regional Minister, Kabuna Ochi Dakumens, has said the port of Takrade has been a major propeller of economic activities in the Takrade metropolis. Shipping lines can no longer have any excuse concerning draft limitation in calling at the Takrade port. Mr. President, I also want to make it clear that we have enough space at the Takrade port for businesses for shippers, for oil and gas companies, and for tourism communities. In fact, there is no congestion in the Takrade port. And the ease of doing business here in Takrade is very excellent. The Minister of Transport, Kuku Furisiyama, commended the President for supporting the Ministry in its initiative to introduce local participation in port development. The President will always create the noble environment first and foremost for the Ghanaian indigenous men who are prepared to take advantage of his vision. The vision of making the Ghanaian competitive. Believing in it that the Ghanaian has the capacity to compete in any world, in anybody. The president has not been misplaced. And I'm happy that today you yourself have created time out of your business shadow to be here commission this project and all what I can say is to thank you for your support, for your encouragement to make sure that this business or this venture becomes a reality. President Ekufuado said the ongoing expansion and transformation of the port of Takrade was testament to the overarching objective 
of expanding the country's economy while boosting regional international trade. Benefits of these projects are considerable. The enhanced cargo and container handling capacity of the port will trigger improved service delivery and lower tariffs to the advantage of the Ghanaian and West African economies. It will ultimately ensure a competitive environment for maritime trade. I assure you, the government will continue to put in place measures and incentives to support the growth of strategic public-private endeavors to help build a strong and resilient economy. He said the new projects were strategic in enhancing the cargo handling capacity, maintenance and repairs of ships, and also meet the demand of the oil and gas services sector within the enclave of the port. He said since the port of Takradi commenced operations in 1928, it had gone through many phases of development to put it in a position that met a growing maritime trade as well as oil and gas services sector. This government is determined to improve maritime trade and position it as a major economic growth. And that is, I wish to commend the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority for its partnership with the private sector in rolling out these projects. He commended GPHA, Ibistec, and their partners for the considerable developments which would trigger improvement service delivery and lower tariffs to the advantage of the Ghanaian and the West African economies while promoting a competitive environment for maritime trade in the country. The technical service providers for the Customs Division of the Ghana Revenue Authority, Ghana Link Network Services Limited, has signed a memorandum of understanding with its Korea partners, Customs Unipass International Agency, Kupia. The MOU is aimed at enhancing the partnership between the two companies to effectively work to better the clearance not only at Ghanaian ports but other ports within Africa. The partnership, according to Ghana Link, is to enable it to expand its frontiers into other African countries to help in not just enhancing revenue generation but ensuring a smooth clearance system within African port. The ICOM's system has so far been labeled as the game changer in cargo clearance at the port as it provides importers and exporters a smooth end-to-end -end clearing system. The chairman of Ghana Link, Nick Dansu AJ, in his remarks noted that so far the ICOM system being implemented at Ghana's ports is one that all stakeholders have come to accept as the best and effective system in terms of cost savings, speed and transparency among others. He said the ICOM system since its implementation has had a great impact on the country's trade and revenue generation. He noted that an agreement has since been signed with the Gambia to implement its national single window program to enhance the clearance of goods and services at its ports. We have a Gambia delegation here that from here we are going to Gambia. We are developing it. We shall help transform the international trade land escape for our sub-region and continent as a whole. The chairman of Kupia, Kim Yong Sheng, who led the Korea delegation to Ghana, on his part noted that the signing of the agreement with Ghana Link means a lot to Kupia because it affords them a new future. He was full of praise for Ghana Link for taking up initiative to bring the frontiers and expand its services to other countries in Africa. In attendance was a delegation from Gambia to witness the partnership between Ghana Link and Kupia. Through close cooperation between the two organizations, we hope to contribute to the development of countries in Africa by supporting the modernization of their customs administration. In addition, Kupia would like to work with Ghana Link to find ways to contribute to the better livelihood of the people of Ghana. In a related development, the Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority, Reverend Emishadai Ousu Amwa, has heaped praises on the newly introduced e-auction model of the Integrated Customs Management System, ICOMS. According to the Commissioner General, revenue generated from the auction of cars and goods through the e-auction platform has surpassed the authority's target. The first one we did, the reserve price, we got above the reserve price by 6.8%. The next one we did, we got above the reserve price in two total items by 13%. And then the very last one that we did recently, we got above the reserve price by 30%. So you will see that for the three times that we have done it, each one, the revenue that we get above the reserve price is increasing because people are getting to know and then there is increased competition 
on the uh, bidding process and therefore more revenue is coming through. On this part, Chairman Kim Yong Sheik thanked the Commissioner General for the support given to Ghana Link, its local partners, in the successful rollout of the ICOMs and promised to work hand in hand with the authority to add more modules to improve on the ICOMs. Meanwhile, the Minister of Trade and Industry, Alan Kojo Tremantin, has called for continuous improvement and upgrade of the ICOM systems being implemented at the country's ports for revenue collection to make it more robust and flexible to enhance its efficiency and effectiveness. He made this known when the delegation paid a working visit to his office. The ICOM system, he said, would help improve trade facilitation and aid the country to meet the changing dynamics of trade facilitation in the world. When we finally fully uh, launched the project, um, we were convinced that it would improve first uh, revenue mobilization, uh, secondly also the efficiency uh, in terms of uh, uh, trade facilitation, moving goods uh, in and out of our, our, our ports and our borders. We were very convinced about that. All right, so you're welcome back. It's now time for us to take the phrase of the day. And the phrase of the day is jetty. Jetty. A jetty is a structure that is perpendicular or at an angle to the shoreline to which a vessel is secured for the purpose of loading and unloading cargo. All right, so you're welcome back. It's now time for us to zoom into our discussion proper tonight. And tonight we're taking a look at the enforcement of safety regulations uh, on fishing vessels to meet international best uh, practices. And with us in the studios to do this discussion is Captain William Esson Thompson. He is Deputy Director in charge of surveys and inspections at the Ghana Maritime Authority, GMA. Also in the studios with us tonight is uh, Nana Dr. Oyeman Ofori Eni. Uh, who is the board secretary of the Ghana Industrial Trawlers Association. Good evening, gentlemen, and welcome. Good evening. Yes, uh, let me begin with you, Captain Thompson. And uh, <clears throat> I just want to find out from you, uh, we understand that you are uh, rolling out this particular uh, you know, policy that's aimed at regulating uh, fishing vessels and to ensure that they are actually seaworthy. Uh, can you bring us up to speed with this particular um, policy and uh, the, the, the reasoning behind it? Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start by saying good evening to your viewers, uh, especially um, my guys at the port, the marine surveyors who are in the center of this and are, are doing their best to uh, let this see the light of day. Now, um, yes, uh, it's the mandate of the authority. It's been the mandate of the authority all this while, except that um, at some point in time, um, the direction that the authority chose did not uh, seem to uh, give us the uh, required outcome. Mm. What I'm saying here is, uh, if you take DVLA, for instance, right now you know that there are third-party companies right. that do the inspections on DVLA's behalf. Yes. So, in times past, that's the direction that the authority chose. Mm. And um, we realized recently that um, we're not getting the desired results in that we ended up with ships carrying the authority certificates that were not properly inspected. Okay. So the authority uh, changed stack. We kind of uh, changed the policy and uh, we employed our own technical staff. Okay. And well, once we got them in place and the system in place, we engaged um, industry. We had several meetings and all and discussed um, the program that we we're going to put up. So mm. that's what has brought us where we are. Mm. Yes. Okay, so let me come to um, Nana and find out from you whether you are really aware of this particular policy that the uh, GMA is rolling out, uh, which is to ensure that, uh, you know, fishing vessels are really seaworthy and, uh, are, you know, complies with all the rules and regulations. Uh, governing uh, fishing and, uh, you know, the vessels that you use 
uh, on these expeditions. Let me say a good uh, evening to the weavers. Let me start off by saying that industry has always been aware. Mm. If you can draw your mic a bit closer. To industry you. has always been aware. Uh, no, I'm saying you should draw your mic closer. Oh, okay, right. yes, industry yes. has always been aware. Thank you. We've had a lot of engagements uh, led by my friend and brother, uh, Captain Thompson. Yes. Um, like he said, uh, not too long ago, we had independent uh, surveyors who were conducting surveys. And for us, we chose who, want, who we wanted to work on our vessels. Mm. We are not technical people. They approve them. So when the time comes for you to renew your licenses, that is a fisheries license, the requirement is go to uh, GMA, get different surveys done. Mm. So safety equipment survey, uh, oil pollution, uh, and a few other things. Right. Ask whether they were doing them to meet their requirements or not. We are not, we are not competent enough to pronounce. Mm. But we were notified that they were taking over, and I think they've taken over for some time now. Mm. Uh, along the line, I think some were a bit, uh, some close about two years, we were informed that uh, Ghana intended to sign on to some new conventions. Mm which required that the conditions of the vessels ought to be worked on. Right. So safety equipment, the hull and the machinery needed to be worked on to mm. meet those international standards. Uh, there were reasons that we couldn't meet those requirements. Okay. But as we speak, a lot of works are being done. Mm. And we know they are pursuing the right course of action. And they have our support. That is what I would say for now. Mm. Yeah. All right. Okay, so um, let me find out from you, Captain Thompson. I just want to, there appears to be uh, somewhat a general lack of safety uh, in terms of vessels that, that, that go fishing at sea. Uh, what do you think is the reason? Uh, what could this be attributed to? Thank you very that much. That is, if you have identified or you have rec rec recognized or realized this is a fact. Yeah, it goes to tie in with what uh, we we're just saying. Mm. So over the period, mm. proper inspections and surveys were not being done. Mm. And that meant that the standard of the vessels kept going down. So like you said, uh, we had meetings. It wasn't like um, the authority because we had a mandate, mm. just foisted it on them, no. We started by having meetings and we had several engagements and discussed the way forward, which we believe has brought us here. We, we didn't start applying the full brunt of the regulations. That would have you know, completely collapsed the industry. What we did was that we concentrated on, for instance, our safety and life-saving equipment mm. first. And then we moved it on to the other aspects of um, the vessels safety so yes the standards were low and it was because of the reasons we gave earlier but right now there's a program in place that is bringing up the standards to the international level that we're talking about now. Mm. Mm. okay so let me come to you um uh, nana uh, doctor mm. <laughs> nana is okay yes nana let me come to you uh, do you agree with me when people are said or when people uh, say that there seem to be uh, that lack of safety. The same question that I put to Captain, uh, you know, with, with your vessels. Uh, to an extent, yes. Mm. But once again, there are reasons for. Um, most vessel owners are not technical people. Mm. And so for us, what we know we need to do with the GMA is a periodic or yearly surveys. Mm. So a surveyor who they appoint for you or somebody from the GMA himself mm. comes to conduct a survey, oh, on. one on the safety equipment, mm. on the safety radio, and oil pollution. The surveyors come on board a vessel, inspect the vessels, draw your attention to defects. Mm. And once you meet those 
or once those defects are worked on, they pass you, you then move on to the fisheries with your certificates, and then you take your fishing license. Right. That's been. Mm. Uh, when they started the recent operations, we've been exposed to a lot more that we needed to have done that we weren't even aware. Mm. Now, we are not only talking about the condition of the vessel, i.e. the safety equipment or uh, the hull and machinery. Right. We are now focusing even on the crew. So if you like, crew welfare has become a very major issue that we will take on board seriously from next year. Mm. Something that we thought as, as owners of companies and as employers, we had the right to engage them. Mm. We've been taking through a lot more things. Mm. And, and specifically, I'm referring to the ILO CI 180, mm. which mandates the, 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 the competent authority mm. to oversee to who you recruit, the type of training he needed to have, and all those other things. So a lot more things are being done. Mm. And I think that is the way we should go. Mm. All right. On Friday, May 6th, uh, this year, 2022, yeah. Um, 11 people lost their lives. Yeah. That was the crew of a vessel, uh, yeah. MV Comforter. Yeah. Um, and 11 people died, including the, the captain of the yeah. uh, vessel. How did you receive this news? Uh, let me say shocking. Mm. Uh, if I tell you anybody there, I mean, I'm talking about the, the, the practitioners, anybody mm. thought a vessel was going to sink. Nobody thought about that. Mm. Uh, we knew some of the vessels needed to be worked on. Yeah. But, and Captain will bear me, almost every year the vessels go to dry dock, except we say that they only go to work at the bottom part. So mm. they scrape the bottom, paint with anti falling and a few other things. And then uh, they didn't pay proper attention to something. But to think that a vessel was going to sink. Uh, nobody thought about that. Right. So, shocking, yes. We, we were all shocked. Mm. We were all shocked, yeah. Okay. And uh, since then, have you, I, I believe you have heard from families of these. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, deceased uh, industry deceased. Uh, was directly involved. First, a committee was set mm. to investigate by the GMA. Mm. They had a rep from industry mm. and reps from different institutions. Mm. I think their report is out. I've read the report. Uh, I know the conclusions that they, 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 they drew. Mm. Um, we've dealt with the families. Uh, we've worked on some immediate compensation for some whilst we are waiting for insurance compensation. Mm. But let me also, at this point, uh, say a very big thank you to the Deputy Minister for Fisheries. Mm. He played a very, very, very significant role. But he led the process in visiting every family that lost a seaman. Mm. We went to every family, we did whatever we have to do, traditionally, customary, and we've arranged some monies for them, like I said, waiting for insurance to pay mm. them the, the mm. lump sum compensation. Right. But we've also learned a lot of lessons. Mm. If you read the report, it gives you an, a lot of insight into some of the things mm. that we need mm. to do. And for, for us as industry, it is a reason why we are buying into whatever the GMA is doing now, because we know if we want to avert future accidents, mm. then we need to take their technical advice seriously. Right. Okay. So he mentioned, Captain, that um, a committee was set, set up uh, to investigate this particular uh, incident. What's the status of the investigations? Well, uh, I wasn't a member of that committee, but mm. uh, the committee has finished its work. Mm. Initial report came out, um, it was revised, and the final report has been issued and then uh, given to the authorities. So, um, like he said, he's read it, mm. and uh, so probably it's out there, you could have it uh, mm. anytime you, you want. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, can you tell us, before a vessel goes on a fishing expedition, what role does the GMA play? What do you do? What are the processes you go through uh, to okay the vessel? And, and to, uh, you know, um, certify that it is seaworthy? Uh, just, just to give uh, the right picture, it's not like before 
the vessel sets sail mm. to go out every time mm. GMA mm. officers come and inspect. No, no, no. Okay. Um, we carry out periodic inspections Inspection. and surveys, yes. Okay. So, for instance, if, and like you said, uh, you're talking about a survey for the safety equipment, something for the radio, and, and then the oil, oil, pollution. oil pollution. Yes. So, once that is done, if you find, if the inspector finds the vessel okay, he will put up a report, and then based on the report, a certificate will be issued to the vessel. This has a duration of one year. Mm. So for that one year period, um, the surveyor or the inspector would not be visiting the ship mm. to go and inspect it. It is believed that the certificate carries that vessel through for one year, right. except in cases where, for instance, the surveyor might be in port mm. when the ship is in port and he might notice something yes. or a report might come to him that something has gone wrong with the ship, mm. then he will find it necessary to go back and check. Mm. But normally, we would not go to inspect a ship every time it comes to port before it sails. That, okay. That's not how it works. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so let me, can you give us let, a let, let me Let me add a few to you. So mm. just like the DVLA, yes. you go, they test your cars, yeah. and you are given... The road where they certificate. For a year. Yes. They do the same thing. Okay. So once the survey has been done and a recommendation is made that you'll be given certificate, that is done. But that is their side. Yes. So before a vessel leaves the port, uh, there are agencies that we work with. So we work with COSO. We work with immigration because on the vessel we have experts on the vessels. So they de we deal with immigration, we deal with port health because of the safety uh, of the fish, et cetera. Mm. Uh, marine police come to check on your net, mm. uh, the GI weather, they are, they are in conformity with the prescribed uh, uh, specs. Mm. So we deal with a lot of institutions. Uh, but GMA, when the vessel has gone to sea and come, once a while the officers come on the vessels. And the other things that are not necessarily technical, but some relate to the certification, for instance, of the vessels, mm. of the captains. Right. They will come to inspect whether they have the right certification, and for that matter, whether they have the mandate to uh, pilot, if I'm using the right word, those vessels. They do all those things. Yeah. So apart from the certificates that are issued, occasionally when vessels come, they also come to inspect whether the certificates are self-valid, whether they have expired, and if they've expired, what action should you take? Uh, they go to inspect, for instance, uh, where the crew sleep, mm. and sometimes the food they eat, the water that they drink, uh, I've been told, because there's currently there's a, a tripartite committee working on the ILO 188, which seeks to look at the, the, the crew compensation and welfare. Mm. And, all these issues like where they sleep, uh, the food they eat, all these issues are being discussed at the tripartite committee. It is chaired by the GMA, mm. but we have reps from labor, we have reps from organized labor. We are looking at all these things to make sure that whatever went wrong is not repeated and we look, we take a very positive outlook for the, for the future. Okay. Yeah. So, Captain, let me come to you. When you go for these periodic inspections, mm. what are the things that you look out for? Um, uh, that would be difficult uh, <laughs> to go through now because there's a tall list of, okay. uh, it's a checklist. The salient right. the yeah, ones. Yeah, sure. For instance, you'll mm. be looking at, uh, let's say, uh, the life raft. Mm. If, if a vessel were to sink, mm. and for the fishing vessels, because of their size, they don't carry lifeboats, so mm. they carry life rafts. Mm. So you would want to check the expiration date of the life raft. The life raft contains food, water and other things mm. and it has a gas cylinder that uh, pumps it up you know when opens it and pumps it up if uh, there's distress mm. so that um, if it is not in date if it is expired it means that the cylinder for instance may not pump it up okay. in, in, in an emergency mm. for, so for instance you want to check the expiry date of that mm. you would want to check the state of the 
other life-saving equipment. For instance, um, we have what we call SAT, mm. Search and Rescue Transponder. Yeah. We have what we call the EPEB, mm. uh, Emergency Beacon. If the ship sinks too quickly, such that nobody was able to activate anything, mm. the EPEB, uh, upon touching salt water, will send signals, the position and the name and particulars of the ship mm. to the outside world so that people will come and rescue the vessel. Mm. If that is expired, for instance, if the battery is dead, then it means that in an emergency, the ship will not send right. that signal out. Something like that happened with the Comforter 2, and, and, and that's what cost uh, 11 lives because mm. there was a delay in, in the emergency coming out for the rescue team to start. Mm. So these are the salient things that we check. We want to know if the ship has the capacity to uh, maintain its um, oily water generated. We want to know if, um, like you said, the new thing that is coming, the crew accommodation. Mm. And for most of our vessels, that's a very huge concern. Mm. Um, where the crew uh, are housed now is not, is not, very, is not very good. Mm. So these are the things that we are looking at now. And um, like you're saying, they, they're really coming on board this right. time. Yeah, we sit down and discuss with them and we tell them, these are things that you have to do before you sail, for instance. So if you visit the fishing harbor right now, mm. yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot of activity going on. Okay, so I think uh, they are rolling some, some pictures on the screen, if you can yeah. uh, take a look at it, Captain. I, I'm sure you provided these pictures. Can you run us through uh, what, what that is, what those are? Yeah, in fact, uh, what I gave was kind of before and after. Okay. So if, if you could put it that way, you would see, yes, the state of the before. vessel before our inspections, and then you will see the state of the vessel after they had carried out the repairs. Mm. You would see that the, the, there's such a drastic change mm. after they have carried out the, 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 the repairs, and that's mm. very, very important. There's one particular one about the accommodation that I was talking about, yeah. where the crew used to sleep, and then what difference was made after we asked them to. I, I don't know if that will come up. There was one particular one about their crew accommodation. Mm. So I would say that so far, so far, a lot is being done. And I would like to commend uh, industry mm. for now understanding where we are coming from. They didn't used to understand. Mm. But like you said, now they understand where we are coming from and then they are on board with us. Mm. You can see the kind of deplorable state of yes. the vessels as they were. And then mm. you see before, you see after that, mm. Yes. How they look. Yes. Okay, let me come to you, Nana. Yes. How is it that your people are able to use these vessels and get them to that particular state without, you know, bothering to, as it were, uh, take them for repairs or get, get the right things fixed? Okay, so let me make a quick comment on uh, what my, my brother said, Captain mm. said. So you look at the, uh, the seat before and after. Mm. If you are not a technically minded, you only see the painting and you think that is the only work that has been done. A lot more work has been done on board. Mm. Right, so there are technical replacements that have been done on board, EPEP and all other things. So there are things that you don't physically see if you don't go on board. Mm. So it is not just the painting that has brightened the vessels, yeah. but a lot of other equipments have been installed. Mm. Now, uh, you see, if you know how traditionally fishing vessels have operated, mm. fishing vessel operation is not like the cargo where you take a, a consignment and you only go to a destination to deliver and you come back or you go somewhere. A lot of activities, a lot of activities happen on the vessel. So somebody is throwing a net, uh, they are pulling this in, and by the very nature of fishing, you need to keep an eye on the vessel. Mm. Otherwise, you drift into this state. Right. I think a combination of factors. Uh, for me, the prominent one is, is cost of operation now. Mm. And maybe we'll get there. Uh, this year has been particularly a very bad year. Mm. I'll give you some few stats. Uh, by the time we... we, we, we Closes in. That is, I think, 
June ending. So mm. we close it, we start, we close it in July and August. Yeah. Uh, FUEB, as a, uh, if you like, a cost component in the cost build-up, represented about 70% mm. of the total cost, direct cost. As at end of October, it is somewhere around 85. That's how serious it has become. If, we, if something doesn't happen to fuel costs, mm. I don't even know when we even met the requirement, we'll be able to buy fuel. Yes. Now, that significantly affected our cash flow. Right. And for that matter, your ability to be able to raise enough revenue to do that. And I think be, be, there were a bit also, uh, what, what should I use? Uh, a, a bit laxed. They were not whipping us like the way they are doing now. Mm. And you know, if the monies are not there and I can find a way to go and come, <laughs> go and come, I'll do so till I get into this state. So, mm. like I said, it's a combination. Primarily because there is no enough money and then either they had closed their eyes and allowed some other things to have happened. But all well and good, I think we've come on board. Mm. Uh, we are dealing with the fuel issue. Uh, but for now, the most important thing, which I think is the reason why we are here, is the conditions of the vessel. Mm. No human life should be lost for whatever money that you want to make. Right. So let's fix the vessels to the standard. Mm. As for fuel, I'm sure we can still talk about it. Mm. Okay, Captain, uh, we understand there's uh, going to be the signing of an international uh, treaty. Uh, can you tell us about this one? What is it about? GMA um, is going to sign that treaty. It should be a Cape, Cape Town agreement is what okay. we're talking about, yeah. Um, that's a huge topic for <laughs> another day, <laughs> but I'll just give you the gist of it. Um, you know, um, statistics and ILO is saying that um, over the period, almost every year, 24,000 accidents, mm. a lot of them fatal, happen in the fishing industry. Right. And um, if you compare it to the merchant industry, merchant mm. uh, shipping industry, that's about 10 times over. So way back in 1977, the world got woke up and then realized that this was not acceptable. Mm. So they sat in Spain, that's what they call the Tory Money Loss Agreement in Spain, 77, and then put it together. Mm. But the problem is that um, every convention has, has um, what, what we call the coming into force conditions, right? So it's not like the moment the convention is put together, it's in force now. Yeah. There'll be some conditions. And they realized 10 years after, in the 80s, that the 1977 agreement was not going to see the light of day. So in 93, they put up a protocol. They made it less stringent mm. so that industry could buy in, flag states could buy in, and still it didn't see the light of day. So in 2012, they sat in Cape Town. There was a, <clears throat> there was a, a general assembly and then they sat in Cape Town and mm. amended the protocol in relation to the protocol 93 protocol in relation to the uh, 77 convention yeah. to make it suitable for industry now the coming to force conditions for this one is um, that one year after 22 countries with 300 and uh, 3600 vessels mm. of more than 24 meters in length have signed on is when this comes into force. Yeah. One year after that. My last check, I think last month, was that our 17 countries had signed on. So that means that um, we still have some five countries to sign on, not to talk about the number of vessels of 24 meters length. Overall? Yeah, and above. Mm. That should make up the 3,600 before this can come into force. Mm. I'm sure the next question is going to be that is well, where does Ghana stand here? Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ghana is underway. Uh, probably, I should say, Ghana is making way because um, the president has given approval. It is right now lodged with Parliament. Okay. I believe that in the next quarter, in the first quarter of next year, 
Parliament is going to engage GMA for us to go through it. Once they approve, it goes back to the president for his signature, and okay. then we forward it to IMO, and then we are on board. Okay. I believe this will be done early part of next year because there's a commitment for that. Mm. So once this comes into force, and that's one of the good reasons why we should be doing what we are doing, mm. then um, it binds you, and if you don't satisfy the conditions there, you literally are out of the market. Mm. Why I'm saying so is that um, you can go out there fish, mm. all right, but then, then nobody will buy your fish. You don't have a market for your fish, especially for exports. Mm. And it's happened before. Um, I'll come to that later. But it's yes. happened before, sometime in 2013, when the whole of the tuna industry was grounded. Right. EU blockaded our exports. Mm. And that was when I got to know that Ghana was number one in Africa and number four in the world. In the world. Mm. And all our exports were blockaded because we were not satisfying some conditions. Mm. It was very chaotic because you're talking about shipments already on their way out there, mm. and then EU refused to pick them. Right. Yes. So if we don't do what we are doing now and get our acts right, we will end up the same way. In the near future, mm -hmm. yeah. Is that, are you so, talking about a yellow card issue? Yeah, the yellow well, card, yeah, I, I think mm -hmm. right now we are yellow carded, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> so, um, what are we doing so now? So we need to be very careful before we slip to red. Yes, yes. and then that's it. Your yeah. your products are blockaded, and mm -hmm. and if we are still number four, like he's saying, in the world, like with tuna alone, mm -hmm. then that's a big thing. Mm -hmm. There are products I have seen that you don't find on our local market that are exported to EU. Mm -hmm. So we are really big in there. And that's why we have to get this right. Otherwise, uh, the industry will suffer. Mm. Right. Now, now, you are from the Ghana Industrial Trawlers yeah. Association. <clears throat> I just want to find from you, uh, how many industrial trawlers do we have in this country? Um, before closes in, I think we're 70, 72 or 74. But mm. I know 14 left somewhere last week mm. uh, with the intention that they are going to refit as mm. whether they will come back or not. That we can't tell. So, mm. We're around 15, 55 something there about. Mm. Yeah. But let me, let me say something to the, the, the Cape Town Agreement. Uh, there are a lot of, if you, if you read the literature, there are a lot of conventions, uh, protocols that regulate fisheries in various aspects. So mm. vessel design and manufacture, uh, crew, safety, et cetera, et cetera, and, and the conditions of the vessel post-production, etc. Uh, you look at the International United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS 1982. You look at the IMO, that is the Cape Town Agreement, CTA mm. 2012. You're looking at in IMO International Convention on Standards and Training, a lot of them. I don't know how many of these conventions and, 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 and protocols we are implementing now. Mm. I think we need a special team from the GMA to begin to look at all this because they are all for fisheries and they are all crafted for the well for the well-being of the industry I think we should begin to domesticate some of these conventions and, and protocols mm. and do the necessary enactments to make them law so then we can give them the right power to work with mm. because if you read some of these things the uncles the uh, ILO work in fishing convention and all other things, if they have the mandate or if these things are made law and they have to use them to work, I'm sure it will fast track some of these delay processes mm. and people would comply. Mm. So maybe what we need to do is to begin to look at all these numerous, some are by uh, FAO themselves, some are by ILO, some are by IMO. And I think we need to find a way to get all of them, uh, domesticate them into our laws, then we can tax them to work with. Mm. Because if they are not, they, some are not legally binding. Right. Right? Uh, they may pick and choose, and because of the exposure, may want to apply some. But if you meet people who are too rigid and want to take the law, I will say that, my, friend, my brother, you don't have the legal mandate to even in, in, enforce that something. So mm. we need to begin to look at the legal aspect of how to domesticate some of these laws so that it will make their work 
Very easy. Mm. Can you, if, if I should add a little yeah, bit yes, what he's saying. What he's saying is very true in the sense that um, um, until recently, and I want to give this out to the Honorable uh, Minister for Fisheries. Yeah. Okay, the Honorable she, yeah. Yeah, Okumsi. She has said it that <laughs> until mm. she sees a certificate yes. from GMA, yeah. no more fishing, fishing license. license yeah. okay. Simple as that. Mm. Yeah. And I'm telling you, that is what is making the operations that we are doing are very effective. Yeah. Mm. Because in the past, the person, it's, it's not like um, the merchant site that you move from one port to the other. Mm. So if your documents are not right and you are not picked up in Ghana, in Nigeria, mm. a post take control of second fish mm. can pick you up. Mm. For, for the fishing, you move to the fishing grounds and come back to Ghana. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when we started the program, some of them will sneak in in the weekend, yeah. discharge and go back. Uh -huh. So um, that idea, that decision made by the Honorable Minister that if you don't have a GMA certificate, forget it. You don't mm. get a license. Mm. And she's very strong with that. That single decision is a very good uh, decision. Like uh, he's saying, somebody can say, well, what law mm. do you have? Because the regulations are not in place. Yes. So yes. what law, what right do you have to come and yeah. tell me? Even Absolutely. though there are vessels that are on our flag and that gives us a mandate to control them, mm -hmm. it could bring about a legal tussle. Yes. Right. So if we have domesticated laws, then it makes it easier. Mm. That's just to support uh, what you mm. were saying. Yes, right. Nana, you, you also did make mention of the fact that you have about five, uh, 50 at, uh, you know, vessels now. Yeah, I think 50 uh, you yeah. said there used to be 60, uh, 70 or so, yeah. but you think that 14 have left, yeah. and you are not even certain whether they are returning or yeah. not. Now, I just want to find out from you, out of the 55 or 50, how many are active? Do you have an idea? Oh, okay. So, I know four vessels were at sea. Mm. There are some that have met the GMA requirement. They are not as seen, not because they have it. I know about 10 that have met the GMA requirement. Mm. It is not, they are not as seen, not because they can't go to sea. Right. It may be because of fuel. Okay. Right. So, and then currently, if you want to work with averages, I'm sure for the vessels that are at the port, almost everyone is somewhere around 70% completion. Right. So, if they really want to go to sea, they will go. I am thinking that most of them want to go from January. Okay. Because if, nice. if I'm going to get my certificates today and I'm going to go to the fisheries to pay for a quarter license, mm. which is supposed to cover October, <laughs> November, and December, and I'm only left with two, two weeks, weeks to the end of, why do I do that? Mm. So if the vessels are not, I see, it is, for now it is not so much because some of them have not met the, the, the GMA requirement. Mm. I, at least I know about 10 which are the port and they could easily go to see maybe they have not gone because of fuel. Mm. Some have made their intention that we'll go from next year. Right. So I'm, I'm beginning to think that early next year almost all the vessels will be at sea provided we're able to do something about fuel. Yeah. And, and Kennedy, yes. still to add to what... Uh, what he said. There's, there's this issue, uh, and another you left out this, the net size, the new, oh, okay. yes. new, okay. new regime of the net yeah. size. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so whereas GMA was rigidly implementing their new laws or mm. new uh, directives, yes. fisheries also immediately after the closing had come out with a new policy on GA, that's right. what they call the GA policy, and mm. say reduce certain specs or certain dimensions or remold your. Your, your, your GS. Okay. That took some of them, a lot, but now I'm, I'm sure almost all, the, all of them have met the requirement. Mm. Almost all the 55 I know have met the requirement. But if you haven't met the GMA requirement, then you don't want to go to fishes and say, come and inspect my net. Right. Why you don't have the thing? So those two, the GMA and the fisheries directive on the, on the GS, mm. were partly the reason why most of them couldn't go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But like I said, we, we really are working and working very hard on them. Mm. All right. So you are watching um, I on Port here on Metropolitan Television. And tonight we are taking a look at the enforcement of safety regulations on fishing uh, vessels uh, to meet international best practices. Uh, with me in the studios during the discussions, Captain um, William S. Van Thompson, who is the Deputy Director in Charge of Surveys and Inspections at the Ghana Maritime Authority. And indeed, also in the studios is Nana Dr. Um, Oyiman Ofuri Eni. Uh, board Secretary of the Ghana Industrial Trawlers Association. Uh, we're going for a quick break. When we come back, we'll continue the discussion. Please do stay with us. 
Every now and again, Goil makes good things happen. This time, Goil has introduced Super XP Run 95, a higher grade fuel loaded with additives and yet sold at the same price as normal fuel. Goal Super XP Run 95 enhances engine performance like never before. It maintains the engine by keeping it clean from carbon deposits. Goal Super XP Run 95 is designed to burn slowly and thus improves fuel economy, making you save money after several kilometers. Goal Super XP Run 95 gives you a smooth driving experience that is less vibrations. Fill up with Goal Super XP Run 95. Now there's no need to pay more for any higher grade fuel. Goil has that sorted. Goil, good energy. Electricity, electricity, our taxes, our taxes, our future. Because you see, without our taxes, we wouldn't have good roads, good schools, better hospitals, street lights, and other very important social amenities. When we pay our taxes, we give our children free and quality education. Tell God, my money too small. Why should I pay my tax? Look, small. Salifu, it doesn't matter how small or big your business or income is. You still have to pay your taxes. The little taxes from each and every one of us, when put together, could give your community clean water. Or that deprived school with tables and chairs. Please pay your taxes. It is your responsibility. It is your civic duty. It is the law. Impressive factory. If only I had listened to you, I wouldn't have been in this mess. That devastating fire virtually wiped out the whole factory and my warehouse. Remember my misfortunes last year? Serene insurance assets all risk fire policy that I took were there to pay for my damaged stocks in the warehouse. And my machines that were affected by the floods have been replaced. My accident vehicle is back on the road. Thanks to Serene Insurance Motor Policy. Currently, my goods are on the IC covered with the American Cargo Insurance Policy. I was just telling Ajima about Serene Insurance. Oh, Ajima, tell him more. As a road contractor, I make sure I do my contractors all risk insurance for the projects and then workers compensation for all the workers on site with serene insurance they will make sure they'll cover your known tomorrow today serene insurance a new face of insurance call us now MPS Terminal 3 is Africa's new state-of-the-art container terminal at Tema Port. For manufacturers, agro-processors and traders, the new port means business can be done faster. This infrastructure boost will improve Ghana's port handling capacity, connect more trading routes and oil the engine of growth for the economy, creating greater opportunities across all sectors as Africa's markets merge and become the largest trading bloc globally. MPS. We connect. You thrive. Okay, you're welcome back. I've been told by the production team that we can activate the phone lines now for you to call and contribute to the discussion. The number to dial is 020-552-8353. 020-552-8353. We have some messages here. Uh, let me try and then go over them. This one says, good evening, sir. The problem with the fishing industry has mainly been lack of consistent monitoring and effective follow-ups. We have always considered the fishing industry to be for lesser educated crew and are looked down upon, unlike in the Iranian, United Arab Emirates, and other waters where the fishing activities are monitored by devices. So a fishing vessel engaged in illegal fishing operations can be detected with the click of a button. Captain. Yes, you are from the Ghana Maritime Authority. Do you have any plans uh, to also do same, uh, perhaps in the near future? In fact, we have uh, same. Okay. The fisheries have they have a monitoring. Yeah, okay. they have. In fact, on all the tuna vessels and trawlers, they have yes. transponders. Okay. So they have the record of everywhere you went, and then it's there. The data is there, so mm. it exists. Okay. But all right. Let, let me just add. Uh, we met the fisheries ministry. I think on. Either Wednesday, mm. 
currently beyond the transponent, we are introducing videos. Okay. So then, as you go fishing, the recording is done. Wow. Those devices are, they used to be on the, uh, I think, uh, the, the tuna for pilot. Okay. They've ceased, but very soon, both tuna and trawlers will get the videos installed. Beautiful. That's yeah. wonderful. Okay. So then everything that you do, whether you are using undersized mesh or mm. you are throwing fish away, all those things will be captured. Yeah. Awesome. We just met the fisheries on Wednesday. Awesome. Yeah. Did you say throwing fish away? Is, is there, are there instances where fish is thrown out? Oh, a lot. <laughs> okay. Why? <laughs> okay. A lot of reasons. So, uh, you go fishing mm. and I have argued that, you see, you give me a license to go and fish within this area. Mm. Now, you don't tell me where I would find juveniles. Okay. So I go and I'm not guided. I throw my net and I have a juvenile. Mm. The law says it is an offense to have a juvenile. It is also an offense to throw them back. Okay. Now, you don't. So tell once you harvest, you have the. the, the, the <laughs> You are supposed to dispose of them in a proper, in a proper manner. Okay. But sometimes, uh, especially you run into a school of fish. There are just too many. Mm. By the time you finish working on the one that you pull, maybe you are pulling the second one. Mm. And some are already gone bad. Mm. So they are, they are very legitimate. Not necessarily because they are small. They are, sometimes the crew are overwhelmed by the sheer numbers that they have just pulled on the deck. Mm. Because by the time the 13 or 14 crew will finish putting them in the boxes, there will be still some remnants there that will, will start going bad. Mm. And you are pulling the next one. You throw them out. But right. all these things, it, as best practices, some of them, you have to find a way to document them. Mm. It is sometimes the absence of the documentation and others that create a problem. And mm. I think we are engaging. Mm. And for me, when the challenges come and we engage, ultimately we find solutions too. So, yes, fishes are thrown on board. Uh, a lot of vessels have been fined for throwing them away. Mm. I've contested, not necessarily saying that you can't throw them away or supporting the throw away. But if you don't want me to harvest juveniles, give me some guide. Absolutely. Okay. Because and if you give who's, me like. Whose who's responsibility is it to give me that guide? Okay. Fisheries. Uh, the not, Fisheries not Commission? The, yeah, Fisheries. Or Ministry of Fisheries? Fisheries Commission. Development. Okay. Yeah. okay. But the ministry has to make the policy for mm. the commission to implement. Mm. Have you had occasion to go discuss with them and request for, and put oh, this we, particular we've request before them? We've had a lot of discussion. In fact, and what's their problem? What's, what's the, the, the challenge? A lot. So, you see, we've, since the last research vessel was done away with, mm. almost 30 or something years ago, you don't have a research vessel. Right. Because you have a research vessel which is at sea every day. Mm. They know where different species are. Mm. And so they can alert you that we've notified or we've observed that they are small size fish here, so don't go there. Yeah. A little notice and the trawlers will stay away. Mm. But you don't have a research vessel, so how do you even do that research? Yeah. So the, the thing is that I can't go to sea uh -huh. to fish and harvest, you know, juveniles uh -huh. and then come back, uh -huh. you know, not having any good catch yeah. and come to dispose of it. Then I, I, I mean, I've, I've run at a loss. Yes. And so that's what compels them to throw it in, back into the water. Yeah, because sometimes, like I said, apart from the fact that maybe you have so much that whilst working on the one that you already have, I said, mm. you're overwhelmed, so you throw them away. Mm. Sometimes they are, she are not good fish. Right. It is not worth packaging them commercially. Mm. When you, you've just gone to see one week in your one month trip, you start packaging them. Mm. By a week or so, your heart will be full. Yeah. But if the fish is not good, so you don't want to package them. Yeah. You want to stay and have a proper fish. Mm. But I'm saying that fish serve different purposes. Right. Even if, you are not, if they are not good for consumption, leave them there. Mm. But to prevent the vessels from harvesting them, something should guide them. Mm. And that guide can only come when we have a research vessel that is constantly at sea, have, uh, mm. do, taking samples and advising practitioners don't go this area. In fact, yeah. there are very many ways that they can. Because if you find that they are juveniles here, mm. and they, they may be good fish, but except they are juveniles, yeah. mm. you want to protect them, you can enact a law and say those areas are closed. Okay. All right. I got it. Um, let's go into the phone lines and welcome Reverend Captain uh, Derek. 
uh, on the line. He is uh, calling us from Ablikuma. Good evening, sir. Yes, um, good evening, sir. Yes. And good evening to uh, Nana and my senior captain mm. on, on your panel. Right. Yes, I think there are multiple um, problems, both technical when it comes to this marine uh, issue, especially with fishing. Mm. Uh, fortunately, I have worked in the uh, fishing industry here in Ghana for close to 15 years until we started sailing out. Mm. The point here is there is technicality in throwing your net. You don't know what is there. Mm. So rightly, like Nana said, we need a, how, a research vessel. Right. In the absence of the research vessel, all these things we are doing will come back to cost 90. Mm. Number two, what we used to do when we were at sea during the 80s was because we couldn't throw this fish out, we were giving them to canoes that we found alongside. Okay. And that was how some, some of the canoes were landing some fish that they were not even casting their net for. Mm. So, and then again, from when I look at what the system we are adopting, and what is happening outside, we have to be consistent in having a closed season and an open season. Mm -hmm. But the way we are going about it is not helping us because of the politics in it. Mm -hmm. So what I think we can do, when you watch our coastline from Keta all the way to Cape Three Points, there are specific categories of fish that you get. You don't get them wholesale at one place. Mm. So if these are the seasons, then let us close, let's say, from uh, Ada towards uh, Kita yeah. within a certain season mm -hmm. so that we can allow the juvenile fish to be grooming while from Accra towards the three points mm. they can be harvesting. Then right. you can change. Maybe from Accra to Cape Coast, the season comes when you do that, you don't uh, restrict people necessarily, but the fishing will be going on and then strictly monitored. Mm. I think one of the ways we can go about it is to do this uh, close open season with an effective monitoring of the fishes. Indeed, I remember we were going to see with a man called Mr. Bannerman or Dr. Bannerman with fishes mm. who, were, who were coming on board and we were going and he was examining the size of the tuna that people were harvesting. Right. And it was fantastic. But there are multiplicity of problems that we have to sort them out and tackle them one after the other. I am right. glad to know that we are having this um, monitoring devices. System. Yeah. But that is just a step to go. We have other things that we need to do, like fishing, when to apply them, where to apply them, and how to go about them, shallow water fishing and the rest. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Thank indeed, you. Reverend Captain Terry, uh, who called us from Anya. You can also call the number to dial is 020-552-8353. Uh, we are continuing with the messages. This one says, good evening. I feel owners of ma and, or managers of the fishing vessels are not committed to check at all. Uh, what is check? Yes, check. S-H-E-Q. Uh, we do not always need to wait for the regulator to whip uh, to whip us uh, in line before doing the right thing. I believe the association must also up their game by checking their members. This one is from Joseph Oliver uh, Boas uh, from Spintex. He, he says you don't check your members. Uh, maybe <laughs> it's something well, you I'll, have I'll, to I'll, avert I'll, your minds to. I'll, I'll tell you something. Mm. Uh, we had a meeting with, at, at the meeting that Captain was present. Yes. And I raised this issue. Mm. You see, the association, people join the association voluntarily. Right. There's no compulsion. Mm. There's no law that mandates vessel owners to necessarily join yeah. association. It's a voluntary something. Mm. And so you can imagine controlling them. Yeah. What we've put forward that the ministry, the ministry has bought it is, is the idea that if we do a lot of things for you, mm. then you also do something for me. Right. Now, if industry or the association, for instance, can recommend sanctions and the ministry would oblige. Mm. It's a way to go. Right. But we had, we had the support of the minister, the deputy, and the executive director. And so we are going to look at what happens from January. Yeah. I, we said we want to self-regulate. 
if we want to self-regulate, it means we should be ready to obey and comply with the law. Right. So if they would help us, because if the only thing that the association can do to prevent a member from not going to see is to say that suspense is li it suspend its licenses or mm. something. Mm. But if the pers if the recommendation goes and the ministry will not work on it, then virtually there's nothing you can do. Right. So once the ministry begins to work with us mm. and and act on our recommendation, most of these issues will be, will we'll be addressed. We'll okay. All right. Uh, this one says, again, in Ghana, it looks as though a lot of uh, protocols are only exist in our books and uh, are only applied as punitive measures rather than making them part and parcel of the entire fishing industry, which must be adhered to uh, even before people are given licenses uh, to operate. Um, he says, with the fishing year issue, I think it was long overdue because while we were at sea within the mid-80s, this same issue came up. Uh, with the trawlers. In the 90s and 2000, the uh, Persinus. Persinus. Yes. Okay, <laughs> all right. Okay. The Persinus who were not supposed to cast their nets with specific smaller nets uh, so that a smaller tuna size was paired, but that was not uh, to be the case. Uh, thanks, Metro, for the discussion uh, today and many others gone by. It's very educative. Um, Erasmus Philip Aholu of Research and Education Subcommittee of Greater Accra Shipper Committee. Okay, uh, that's the Shipper Committee of the uh, Ghana Shippers Authority. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Erasmus Philip Aholu. Uh, he says, how many of the 55 vessels are Ghanaian owned? That's uh, something somebody wants to know. Okay, so individuals go into different arrangements to acquire vessels. Mm. And if you look at our Fisheries Law Act 625, it mm. talks about uh, Ownership through high purchase mm. and ownership through bill of sale. Right. That is what the law says. Mm. Most, if you go to GMA and you want to register a vessel, they themselves have, would have attached a document for bill of sale. Mm. What does it do? Bill of sale is only a, an instrument that transfer title to you so that you, because if you don't own the vessel, you can't be registered. Yeah. Especially for trawlers where the ownership should be 100%. So they, in their wisdom, decide that, look, by the time you come, when you are buying the forms to go and register a vessel, we attach a bill of sale for you. Mm. So that transfer is done into your Ghanaian company. I have said that. Now, the ministry comes uh, 2017 and say, oh, all of you should go on to high purchase. Mm. So all of us are in high purchase. What I have recommended is that it is not enough to say that, let me prepare documents to show that you, are, you bought the vessel or something. Yeah get the audited accounts of the various companies so you can find out from their accounts whether they are paying. Mm. This is coming from us. Right. So I have this in and I laugh and I say, the association can do as much. We have put forward certain proposals. If the ministry acts on them, it is up to the ministry to find out from individual companies why they are not paying. Mm. And they can deal with that issue on company by company basis. Right. But we as an association would have made a recommendation to the ministry and say, it is not enough for, to transit from bill of sale to high purchase when you are not looking into the accounts to find out whether they've paid or not. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. So this one, that was from uh, Joseph Oliver Bowes uh, from okay. Spintex Road. Let me come to you, Captain, and find out what uh, some of the uh, things are that you are doing uh, to protect sailors on board on these vessels, you know, uh, we often hear about inhumane treatment of some of these sailors and the kind of conditions, harsh conditions under which they work. I just want to find out from you what you are doing as the regulator of the industry, uh, the maritime industry, to ensure that they uh, have some sanity while at sea. So um, we'll start first with the accommodation, their mm. sleeping place. Mm. And uh, like you said, and then I'm sure one of the pictures depicted... Um, when we go on board, we check yes. these things and then mm. we insist that it should be improved. Yes. Um, and what we have done so far, it has been improved to the point where you would say it passes for the sleeping place of any offshore support vessel or something mm. like that. Mm. Not all of them have come to that point. Right. In fact, um, the problem is that the design Wait. of a typical fishing vessel mm. is such that it... it it caters for only so-so and so number of crew. 
the okay more yeah, so i think that's when that's what's showing on the screen yeah this was before yes and you see what it is after mm. you see what it is after if, if it will come okay if we can see the the after the after yeah yeah okay wow that that okay. that, that is what wow. we're talking about it's been transformed. You understand? yes yeah. it's the same same mm. same space mm. Mm. so um <laughs> it's not easy getting it like this right. because people will have to understand and then a lot goes into it. Mm. But what I'm saying is that um, a lot, the design of the fishing vessel, the mm. existing ones in itself, yes. causes this problem. Mm. It, it, it only caters for a specific number of people. And right. you talk about the mode of operation of our, of our vessels, they mm. need more crew. Mm. Mm. So what happens is that there's, this, there's a name for it I will not mention. Uh, <laughs> they, <laughs> on top of the vessel, they put up some kind of structure. Mm. And unfortunately, that's what houses most of our local uh, seafarers. Right. It's just a, a bare place. It's very dark. Mm. Just, I think last Thursday or Friday, I, I went on board some mm. of those ships. And, and that's where there's no provision for any amenities. Yeah. That's where they sleep. Mm. Um, there's no specific regulation, like I said, now, mm. that I can point to and say, uh, Nana, I this mean, is what the law says, so yes. go by it. Yeah. So it's jaw join, getting together, sharing ideas. They have agreed that we need to move from there. Mm. For instance, what you saw, we've moved from there to that. But not every ship can put it up to this mm. standard. Right. So as we speak, we are putting up ideas together to design and convert that existing structure into mm. something that is more, you know, homely and right. um, that would be more comfortable. We are thinking about, if we want to take it out completely, then it will affect industry. They will mm. not have enough crew to effectively work. Right. And that is the design of the ship. So what we're thinking about doing is uh, to convert that into something very comfortable. Mm. Um, you can put some... In fact, I asked, generally, they say they need an, another 10 extra crew that will have to be housed there. Mm. If that is so, you have five double bank beds in a comfortable way, and you insist that they should put lighting and AC in there. Mm. I think that will do for now. Right. That is the next thing that we, we come into. Mm. Um, and I hope that within the, next, uh, the first quarter, for mm. instance, of next year, mm. would have gone that far. For now, the concern from them mm. is that they have had just come out of a close season. Mm. Two months, right? Once. And it ended in September. Another, another it, ended, it ended in August. In so, August. Yeah. So another three months on, right. eh, September, October, November, yeah. they haven't gone to sea. Right. So you can imagine five straight months. Mm. And so um, we always tend to look at that side as well and mm. not just strike the road and say we are the regulator, this, that, that, that. Mm. And that leads me to uh, what we are doing now. Right now, we are not insisting mm. that fix your ship 100% the way we want it as per the deficiencies. Yes. Right now, what we're doing to help them is, is that we look at the very serious deficiencies that are related to life saving, firefighting, and then once you clear them, we give you what we call a provisional certificate mm. that is valid for three months instead of the full term that is one year mm. so that you can go out there and fish, mm. make some money. Yeah. After the three months, you come back and then we will insist that you should carry through with the rest mm. of the um, deficiencies. That's the agreement we have come to now. Right. You know, Kennedy, if we don't do it that way, it's like you want to shut the industry and, mm. then, and then that will not be useful for anybody at all. Right. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much indeed, Captain. Um, Nana, yeah. uh, do you think that um, what the GMA is doing and uh, what the, as a country are doing to protect uh, people that man your vessels, the crew, uh, is enough? Um, yes, except to say that maybe they started a bit too late. Mm. Uh, when I got the invitation, I've been thinking about what could have been done mm. better. And I'm thinking that, you know, when the process of acquiring a vessel, you write to the ministry that with the permission to import. Mm. And once that, so you write, uh, attach the specification on the vessel, some photographs. Once the permission mm. is granted you and uh, the vessel comes, GMA is the first institution that works on the vessel. Mm. At that point, they look at the design, they look at a lot of other things. 
Maybe now that we've come to the conclusion that the design doesn't help us mm. because of the number of crew that we need to have on the vessel, they should begin to look at those aspects as well. Mm. Maybe what we need to do is even go, come to the, go to the GMA for an advice about the type of vessel to import before we even make that order. Right. So then you would have factored all those important issues into consideration before you ordered for that vessel to come. And then when the vessel had come, um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the protocols, I'm looking at the conventions that I've, I've, I've recommended that should be documented. Going forward, I think when you go through the GMA processes, mm. immediately your attention should be drawn to most of these things that you as a vessel owner ought to know. Mm. Because for most of the owners, they only know about the three surveys, mm. oil pollution, safety equipment, and whatever. And right. until recently, it was, it was just ask somebody to come in two days, you are done, and you go back to sea. Mm. So all this convention about uh, how the vessel should look, safety and welfare of sailors, they never, we never even thought it was their mandate. Right. So going forward, I think the education is ongoing, mm. but I think we should go back and start some of these things again. Mm. Let the owners of the vessel know that you don't just acquire a vessel. Right. These are things that regulate fishing vessel operation. Yeah. Onclos, IMO this, mm. uh, 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 Cape Town Convention, yeah. all these things the owners ought to know. And right. then we can work something together with GMA mm. as an association mm. and begin to educate our members. Okay. That will uh, make their work great. Easy. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, viewers, that's how we draw the curtain on this week's edition of Iron Port here on Metropolitan Television. Remember, the show is brought to you proudly by the Ghana Revenue Authority, Guel Company Limited, Serene Insurance, Ghana Link Network Services, and Meridian Port Services, MPS, and proudly, proudly powered by the Ghana Port and Harbors Authority. Many thanks to my guests in the studios uh, tonight, Captain William, as on forms and Deputy Director uh, Service and in Inspections at the Ghana Maritime Authority, and indeed, Nana Dr. Oyeman Ofurieni. Our board secretary, Ghana Industrial Trawlers Association, uh, they are the two gentlemen we've been doing the discussion with. Thank you very much indeed for obliging us, uh, Doc and Captain. And uh, we will entreat you to watch the bridge version of the show on Wednesday at 8.30 on Ghana Television. And also do remember that, God willing, we shall bounce back again next week with another wonderful edition of the show. Uh, my name is Kenny Demona. We entreat you to keep watching uh, the rest of the programs here on Metro TV. And uh, we wish you a super week ahead. Good evening. Show TV, insightful and inspiring moments.